This morning, I'd like to say to all of the dads that are gathered here today, and all the men that are gathered here, thank you for being at church. Thank you for bringing your families. Thank you for setting the example in your homes of being committed to Jesus. We are so thankful for you. Do you know your family and this church family is stronger because of you? It's not easy being a Christian dad today. Often we become fearful of the impact that the world is having on our family. But to be honest, sometimes we as Christian dads are are also fearful about the impact that the world is having on us. We're fearful of not persevering in the faith until Christ returns or calls us home. And so we look towards the future, and sometimes we're anxious that we won't be able to say with the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, these words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Sometimes we fear that we will not be able to say that. And by the way, that's not just Christian men. Many Christians, both men and women, fear that they're not going to make it. You know, John Piper speaks about this fear in a chapter that he wrote in a book called, or he edited, called Stand, A call for the endurance of the saints. He calls it the fear of not persevering. He and he said that some people have this fear, but yet there are two deadly, deadly ways that they try to overcome this fear. Here's the first one. The first way that people combat this is by saying that maybe persevering in faith and in love is not necessary. And that is a tragic and deadly mistake. Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 13, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And so perseverance is crucial for our journey of faith. We learned that, right? In last week's message from Jude, persevere in the faith. We persevere by, do you remember? Building ourselves up in the most holy faith. And praying in the Holy Spirit, that was the second way. And the third way is by keeping ourselves in God's love. Well, Piper says there is a second deadly way that people try to overcome this fear of not persevering, and it's by saying this, I must depend on my own efforts to secure God's full favor. Yes, God may get, may get me started in the Christian life, by faith in Him alone, but perseverance happens another way. God makes His ongoing favor depend on my efforts. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And that thinking leads either to despair or to pride. Certainly not to perseverance. So what is the answer? How do we overcome this fear? How do we face our future with confidence that we will one day hear that, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Well, the answer to that question is found in the last two verses of the book of Jude. Our last message in this series, Contend for the Faith, is this. Praise the God who keeps you. And it comes from one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. In fact, it's a favorite doxology in churches throughout the ages. And we're going to read it together in just a moment. But before we do that, let's just pause and once again ask God to help us. Would you bow with me? Father, as we reflect on your holy word this morning, would you encourage our hearts Fill our hearts with praise for who you are and what you are doing in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Amen. 
This morning, I'd like you to do something with me. Would you rise with me, and would you read together this doxology from Jude chapter, or Jude verses 24 and 25? Read it with me. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the one God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude, which is right before the last book of the Bible. I also encourage you to take your bulletins that you received this morning and follow along on the outline on the back. To those who are God's children, how do we overcome this fear of not persevering? Well, first, this is so important, and it comes right out of these verses, our ability to persevere comes from God. Did you see that? Now, unto Him. This is Jude's response to people who think if they try hard enough, if they're disciplined enough, if they put enough human effort into it, that they will persevere in in their faith until the end. But there is no power apart from God that's able to help us to persevere. The harshest regimen of human discipline cannot do it. It cannot help us. Only God's power is able to keep us. Now, in Jude's doxology, by the way, doxology simply means word of praise. Doxology, and this doxology, he declares that God, through his infinite power, is able to do two things for those he has called. Things that teach us that God is our power. The power is not from ourselves. Here's the first one. His power keeps us from falling. Some translations say, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Stumbling or falling, in Jude's context, does not mean uh, being sinless. Falling means falling into apostasy. We saw that. Being led astray by the false teachers, by being led astray and being condemned. The phrase to keep means simply to preserve. God preserves us from leaving the faith. Do you remember last week we talked about intruders coming into the church, uh, threatening the faith of the church? Jude says that Christ's true disciples will be protected, that they won't be led astray from the truth of the gospel. And yes, throughout his letter, if you look at his letter, the entire thing, Jude is giving great warnings, sharp warnings to his readers, and such warnings could give the impression that the focus is on human effort and human endurance. And so in both verses 1 and verse 24, Jude stresses God's supernatural ability to keep those he has called from stumbling. Now, we love self-help books and stories of people who have turned their lives around by enormous effort. That's very attractive in today's culture of self-transformation and self-actualization. But you know what? That attitude actually discourages many people as well. When it comes to the Christian life, they conclude that they don't have what it takes to persevere to the end. And while that is true, that fact should not discourage them. Because we have an awesome, all-powerful God who is able to keep us from falling. The reason we persevere to the end is because of God's keeping power. He preserves, He holds us in the palm of His hands. Some people ask me the question, well, what what about people like evangelist Charles Templeton? the famous Toronto pastor who preached the gospel with Billy Graham but later renounced his faith. And I simply answer this way. Those God has called as his children, he promises to keep from falling away. 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. In other words, those who truly know Jesus those who are in a life-saving relationship with him, he will never cast away. It's not our power that keeps us. It's his. And for those who have received Jesus as their master and as their savior, that should bring us great comfort. Now here's the second thing that God does for his children. His love and his grace present us perfect before his throne. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault. Now here Jude reminds us of God's grace. His amazing grace. God, his amazing grace becomes 100% for us at the moment of our justification at the moment that we meet Christ as our beautiful Savior, and the moment that we receive Him as our substitute punishment and as our substitute perfection. Do you remember what we learned at Easter? We were reminded of this, that all of God's wrath, all of the condemnation that we deserved was poured out on Jesus. All of God's demands for perfect righteousness were fulfilled by Christ. And that very moment, that very moment by God's grace that we see this treasure and we receive Jesus in this way, His death counts for our death. His condemnation as our condemnation. His righteousness as our righteousness. God becomes 100% permanently, for us, forever at that moment. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 promises this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 31 through 35, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What's the answer? No one. That's the best news. The best news for you and for me, who honestly, sometimes, we feel very unworthy, don't we? And very unholy to ever be in God's presence. Jude's doxology reminds us that we who know Jesus Christ will one day stand in God's presence without condemnation, without fear, but instead with great joy. And by the way, on that day, we will not just be positionally perfect, we will be morally perfect as well. We will no longer give in to temptation and sin. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Jude's words remind us of what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, that he is confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. We can have confidence in that. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, we hear this glorious promise, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
And focusing on that fact will preserve us from falling and that he will present us perfect at his throne. Guess what? That does something for us. When we focus on that fact, it does something amazing in our lives. As preacher Charles Spurgeon said, it kisses away fear. It kisses away the fear that we have of not persevering to the end. And because of all of this, Jude breaks out into this glorious praise, verse 25, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And that's the greatest way that we keep this fear of not persevering at bay. We focus all of our emotional energy on praising God because only God is our all-powerful Savior. We get so worked up and so worried about so many things, including our future. And yet Jude in his glorious ending urges us to focus our praise on God, our Savior, on Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we do that, as the songwriter says, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Do you know what glory means? Can anyone tell me what glory means? Glory, from a human standpoint, refers to the public reputation or fame of someone. But glory in our context here signifies the honor, the resplendence, the beauty that is ascribed to God for his saving work. One scholar writes this, such glory must be publicly expressed and acclaimed. Another says, since God does the protecting and saving and preserving, he receives all the glory, acclamation, and praise. Glory. Then Jude describes to God majesty. Majesty. This speaks of God's greatness. How worthy he is of honor given his exalted position. His transcendence over all. God's majesty is what King David focused on in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13, when he was commissioning his son Solomon to build the temple. Listen to this. 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the majesty, and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God... We give you thanks, and we praise your glorious name. David is praising God for his majesty. And then Jude lifts up God for his power and authority. And we need to be continually praising God for his power and his authority. When we do, can I just tell you something? When you're constantly praising God for His power and authority, you will not feel threatened by anything or anyone else. God is sovereign, and He is in control. The direction of everything is in His hands. No threat against us will prosper. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Very similar to what David said. For you have created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Everything on this earth belongs to God. Isn't that good to know? And then Jude adds, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Reminding us that when we glorify God, we glorify God through Jesus Christ. 
when Paul asked in Romans chapter 7, verse 24, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? His answer is found in the very next verse. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Later on in Romans, he adds this. Chapter 16, verse 27. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. And we come into God's presence through Jesus Christ the one who is our Savior and our mediator, and we declare our praises to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for His glory, His majesty, His power, and His authority, which has been in existence, Jude says, for all of eternity, past, present, and future. So how does daily focusing on God in worship change everything? Well, it is a daily course correction. Did you know that? Every day that we spend with God and worshiping Him is a daily course correction. Jerry Bridges, who was a Christian author and speaker, was once a naval officer, and this is what he writes. He says, In my Navy days, before we had global positioning satellites, we used a sextant to get our navigational position twice a day. At dawn and at dusk, we would, quote, shoot the stars and get position. And invariably after having done that, we had to make a minor course correction. Obviously, if we didn't do that, not only daily, but in our case, twice a day, we would soon find that we were way off course. And then he concludes this way. You and I also need that daily course correction, and we do this as we have focused time with God. Now, Jerry Bridges is not just talking about reading a little verse and then running out the door in the morning. He's actually talking about daily focused worship and communion with God. A time when God's glory and majesty and power and authority is refreshed in our hearts. Consider these words of the psalmist. Psalm 63 verse 1, he says, O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is not water. Do you hear the intensity of his words? That's how we come to God. Worship and communion with God. Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2 says something similar. As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Or again, in Psalm chapter 27, verse 4, he says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in the temple. And this is not a physical beauty he's talking about. It's the beauty of God's attributes. Attributes like Jude is declaring in his doxology. Now here's the takeaway. You and I will not fear about not persevering until the end if we're daily worshiping and communing with God like that. We won't. You see, God will loom just so big that everything else will just vanish away into thin air. All of our fears. Now let's make this practical. Dads, and I'm including myself in this, do we take time with God? I mean, really take time with God. You know what? It will transform us from the inside out. Not just dads, all of us. Do we spend time with God or we just quickly read a chapter and then go on with our day? You know, it is helpful to have a plan, but that plan must direct us to God himself. Yes, we meet with God and his word open in our laps, but the object of that is not just to take in knowledge, and and verses, it's have God speak to us and for us to respond to him. What I've taken to doing is having a journal beside my Bible and I write down verses that God's speaking to me through and then I pray them back to God often. Jerry Bridges, who I mentioned earlier, says this, as I open my Bible each day, I ask, Lord, may I today spend time with you? 
Would you speak to me from your word? Would you rebuke me if I need it? Lord, whatever you, you see that I need today, I come to spend time with you. And then as I begin to read the passage, I respond to God over what I'm reading, and I pray back to him whatever's appropriate in that, pa- that passage. Later this year marks the anniversary of my father's 20th, the 20th anniversary of my father's death. And so Father's Day is always kind of bittersweet for me, and, uh, and now for my wife as well as she lost her dad just a, not even two months ago. You know, my dad persevered till the very end. Some of his last words that he said to us before he passed away were these. It was very interesting. He was laying on his deathbed, and um, he was reflecting about coming to know Christ when he was 23 years old. And you know what he said to us? He said, in looking back, I have no regrets. I have no regrets. That first year, I grieved so much. I was very close to my dad, and some of you know the story, but I went very early in the morning. I would leave the house. I would go sit in my car at a very quiet spot that I found, and I took my Bible, and I had a notepad beside it, and I went through the Psalms over and over and over again. Three Psalms a day. And I'd come to verses like this one in Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I realized that God had an interest in what was happening. As incredible as it seems, God eagerly awaits the homegoing of his children. And then there was Psalm 16, verse 11. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And it wasn't easy. Sometimes I'd sit there and I'd cry. While I was worshiping God, I'd say, God, I don't know why this happened, but I still trust you that you are good. And God slowly started healing my heart through that time of worship and communion with him and his word to me. And by the way, this all happened because many years earlier I had established a practice of daily time of worship and communion with God in a very personal way. Don't wait until crisis. Now this doesn't mean that we become legalistic about our time with God. We don't earn blessings with God through it, nor do we forfeit blessings when we miss it. And nor do we always expect God to speak to us in a very dramatic way. Sometimes he does. Sometimes we just sit in his presence and we just enjoy him. And that's good. In fact, the course corrections are often, like the Navy ship, incremental. But they are necessary. Keeping God and the truth about who he is as our guiding star, our course correction. We don't need to fear when we come to know and love Jesus. God is all-powerful. He promises to keep us until that day. It's all up to him and not up to us. Aren't you glad about that? He will present us perfect and holy in God's presence through Jesus Christ, through his completed work on the cross. Guess what our response is? Our response is to worship, to glorify and exalt our all-powerful Savior. And we do that daily as we commune together with Him. Amen. Let's pray. God in heaven, we lift up Your name. You're worthy of all of our praise. We are so dependent upon You, dependent on You for our salvation dependent upon you for our sanctification, dependent on you for our preservation. Only you can preserve us so that we will preserve until that day, that day that you return or call us home. And so we exalt you together, for you are a Savior and Lord who reigns forever. And this we declare in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.